If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. I appreciate you listening once again. Now, in an early 2013, the first reported human cases of H7N9 avian influenza were reported in China. Now, since that time, there's been more than 1,500 confirmed cases, and about half of these cases have been reported just since last October. Uh, the death toll is about 40% of the infected. Uh, there was a study published this summer in PLOS Pathogens that showed that the virus um, is about three mutations away from changing into a form that's easily transmitted between humans. So how worried should we be about this influenza type, its potential adaptability to spread among humans, and its pandemic potential? Joining me now to share the story behind the story is Michael Osterholm, Ph.D., Dr. Osterholm is the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, better known as SIDRAP, at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Osterholm, welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you very much, Robert. Good to be with you. Thank you. Um, now, before we I get into your thoughts of the future of this pathogen, let's take a look at the virus and the recent past. So what is H7N9 avian influenza, and can you discuss the recent history of this strain since 2013? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me uh, at the outset uh, make a disclosure here. I think that's very important to your audience. Uh, I, I work a lot in the area of influenza and have for decades. And I must say, with all honesty, I probably know less about influenza today than I did 10 years ago. Um, it, the more we've learned, the more all of us in the influenza community have been really challenged in terms of what we learn and what it means. And so uh, this is an area that I would tell any of your listeners, stay tuned. Uh, it is a very, very critical area in terms of causing human disease and the potential for future pandemics, but it's one also that we, we have a lot left to learn. Um, in terms of influenza, let's take a step back and remember that influenza viruses originated actually in wild aquatic birds evolutionarily many, many millions of years ago. And at that time, those viruses were not capable of infecting mammals as such because the receptor sites for binding to the lung cells uh, were different in wild birds uh, than aquatic birds than they were in, in, in mammals. Over time, what's happened is, is that there has been an adaption that occurs with these viruses where even though they're typically excreted uh, out the rectum in feces, uh, the viruses can, if it passes through certain other animal species or in some rare instances even gets directly infect humans, genetic changes can occur where it now becomes a, a pathogen or a virus that humans themselves can become infected with, meaning that it attaches to our lung cells. The pig becomes a very important partner in all of this because pigs actually have receptor sites for both the bird viruses and the human viruses. The influenza virus is notoriously sloppy at reproducing itself. We like to think it's incredibly promiscuous. And if you were to, by chance, get two different influenza viruses in the same lung cell, which can surely happen if you were exposed to multiple viruses, they will readily swap out genetic material and basically create a new virus, or in some cases, just a point mutation. The H and N part of influenza viruses refer to the hemagglutinin, a part of the virus that's very important in the attachment, and the neuraminidase, which is the part I like to call the kind of the hand grenade of the virus, that once the virus is in a human cell, it has to escape to get out and basically then infect others. And the neuraminidase is a key chemical in disrupting the cell and actually is what causes a great deal of the damage then to the cell when it 
to bust it open so the virus can escape is what kills the cell. And we know that we have these number of different kinds of hemagglutin and neuraminidase combinations. So when we talk about these, uh, you know, the, the 18 plus uh, hemagglutinins, et cetera, we know that there are a few that are particularly likely to cause human disease, H1, H2, H3, H5, H7, and H9, out of the more than 18 of them. Um, and this particular one, H7 and 9 that you asked about, was not one that we recognized as a potential for causing human disease until five years ago when it first really emerged on the scene in China. At the time it emerged, it was a very different kind of virus uh, than we've seen before in terms of bird viruses infecting humans. You may recall back in 1999 in Hong Kong, in which the virus H5N1 emerged, mm -hmm. a, a bird virus basically that went from wild birds to, to poultry and killed lots of poultry um, and then infected some humans. Fortunately, we never saw ongoing transmission in humans, which would be the trigger for starting a, virtually a, an influenza pandemic. Well, when H7, HN9 showed up in China five years ago, there were no sick birds around. Nobody could figure out what was going on only to find out that the birds were getting infected with this virus in terms of poultry, they were not getting sick. And rather than primarily excreting the virus out, as I call the south end, they were blowing it out of the north end. It was a respiratory agent. And this made it incredibly challenging to try to identify where cases were occurring in, in birds, and, and largely the only way we knew was when people got sick. Now, after... Fast forward three to four years, the, we saw waves of illness each winter in China, you know, 50 to 100 cases, uh, 120 cases, and it actually appeared to be waning as of last year. And then all of a sudden this past winter, uh, we saw an amazing occurrence of H7N9 where now the virus has clearly changed some, and as you pointed out earlier, with the Plus Pathogens article, there was evidence of genetic changes that made us very concerned that it was looking more like a human-like influenza virus. And, of course, the case numbers exploded in terms of humans. Uh, and also, finally, this virus actually started killing birds, so we call a high-path virus. So to make a long story short, this is actually a virus that I've been very concerned about. And, in fact, in my book, Deadliest Enemies, I wrote the chapters on influenza over a year ago before this fifth wave ever occurred, and I actually use this one as the scenario-driven uh, virus to say this is what a pandemic might look like, and unfortunately, I fear that that still may be the case one day, that this, as it continues to pass through so many birds and humans, may ultimately become the next pandemic strain. Right. Now, the, the researchers of the Plos Pathogens paper, I, and I'm so sorry, I don't recall who they were, um, they, they really discovered something pretty scary. And uh, some public health officials, and I believe including yourself, um, fear this has a very high potential to mutate to become a pandem pandemic virus. Um, yeah. So in your book, uh, as you mentioned, Dr. Osterholm, Deadliest Enemy, uh, you dedicate more than one chapter to influenza. And in one chapter, you, you lay out a whole pandemic scenario uh, around H7N9. Would you like to um, elaborate on that? Yeah, well, thank you. And, and again, let me say that um, in terms of where this virus sits right now in the risk picture, um, you know, we had the same concern with H5N1 back in, in 2012 where we thought, oh, my gosh, it seems to be getting close to a human transmitted agent. This could be the next pandemic strain. And so I think we have to be a little bit uh, humble here and say, even though the data might support that this could be a problem, we don't know if it is. And, you know, just as H1N1 snuck up on us in 2009, a different version of an already circulating virus, um, you know, we don't know this when they're going to go. But if I had really my money on it, I'd say this is surely a very, very high-risk one that would be of concern. And that's why I ended up writing about it, actually, as the scenario. And, and the ultimate irony of all of this is, is that if you go back and look at what's happened over the past six to eight months, it was exactly how I wrote about it in this chapter over a year ago, saying this is how an, an unfolding pandemic might look. Now, I'm very, very happy to report as of today, here in the end of August in 2017, the activity has been reduced. It's uh, only a very few cases right now. Uh, that wintertime peak that we saw that extended well into the summer uh, appears to have been dampened substantially. But nonetheless, this could come back again uh, this next fall, early winter, 
And one of these times, it's very well the appropriate set of mutations or reassortments uh, could occur, and this could be the next pathogen. In the book, I talked about how influenza really is still by far the lion king of infectious diseases in that the rapid spread around the world would uh, mean that there's very little we could do to control it. Uh, our vaccines would be a day late and a dollar short, uh, meaning that we just couldn't produce much vaccine and we don't even know how effective these vaccines would be. It's very possible limited effectiveness. Uh, we don't really have any kind of stockpiles of effective drugs that could be used. And unfortunately, this could really unfold like a 1918 uh, pandemic scenario where there, you know, between 50 and 100 million people died worldwide at a time when the world was uh, only one-third of the size that it is today. So, you know, we, we worry about this, and we know that this surely could be the next pandemic uh, causing agent, and if it is, uh, we're in for a hell of an experience. So, you know, after those dire words, um, what can we and what should we be doing right now? Well, you know, this is one of the challenges that uh, has been personally and professionally difficult for me. Uh, you know, our group was the one that published a major paper back in 2011 in which we as public health uh, practitioners who clearly believe in the power of immunization and the important aspects that that can have in terms of disease reduction realized that by no one's fault, it wasn't as if somebody intentionally was misleading, but because of the lack of understanding of interpreting studies, looking how effective vaccines are and using what we call serology or blood sampling, uh, it turned out that people had grossly overestimated how effective the 1940s flu vaccine is. Uh, and that's the one we've been using since then. And we found that, in fact, it was much, much less effective than 70, 90%. Some, you know, cases a good year would be 50%. In many years, depending on even on the ages, it would be close to zero. In addition, as we saw in 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic, relatively milder pandemic that occurred, there, most of the world never had access to vaccine in that first year because it's just so difficult to produce. It's like kind of growing corn in the Midwest, you know. Just because you want to have it done faster doesn't mean you plant twice as many acres and get it done in half the amount of time. And so by the time that the really serious wave in 2009 actually went through the world, we still had almost no vaccine available at all. And so I wouldn't count on having an H7 n 9 vaccine should this emerge tomorrow we've got to invest in new vaccines. As I detailed in our, my book, uh, on an annual basis right now, we're spending over a billion dollars a year uh, researching HIV vaccines, which I think is very important, and I wouldn't for a minute reduce that. But we've been averaging less than $25 million a year researching new, what I call game-changing or broadly protected flu vaccines, and for which many of us believe we actually could uh, develop uh, very effective vaccines potentially down the road. So I think that one of the things we have to concentrate on right now is how to get new and better flu vaccines and vaccines that we can actually vaccinate the world in advance of a pandemic and would be broadly protective for many, many years. Um, wouldn't that be something to be able to take influenza off the table like we did smallpox at uh, you know in the 1970s? So that, that's my hope, and uh, if we don't do that, I can tell you when the next pandemic occurs, which is going to happen, just like you know the seasons, it's going to happen eventually, I think we'll regret mightily that we didn't pay more attention to this, as this could really wreak havoc in the world. Yeah, and I want to encourage listeners, if they want to uh, read about this and other topics concerning infectious diseases and outbreaks, uh, check out his uh, Dr. Osterholm's book, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. There's a whole chapter just... Uh, laying out there the, what a pandemic would look like, and it's uh, multifaceted, and it's quite quite a frightening scenario. And um, I want to thank you, Dr. Mike Osterholm, for your thoughts and expertise on this most critical issue. Thank you.